Welcome to Discovery Watch with John Kaiser. I'm your host, Jim Goddard. Welcome back to the show, John. It's a pleasure to be back, Jim. John, Midland Exploration published an update for its mithril project in the James Bay region, and the stock is sinking. Is the mithril copper play shaping up to be a bust? Well, not yet, but the market certainly thinks that that will be the outcome when the company uh, reports its uh, final results for the drilling program in mid-May. Now, I think part of the issue is that uh, they are, have chosen to batch the results of a 10-hole program, 2,400 meters. It began in mid-March. Uh, uh, it stopped in, in mid-April, mid, uh, just before the Easter weekend. Uh, they are probably in receipt of some results right now. And as a rule in the uh, junior resource sector, if you get an assay, a hole that's absolutely fantastic, you usually get it out there really quickly uh, to get the market all excited and demonstrate that you have a discovery. And the decision to, well, we're going to collect all these results and then put out a big news release uh, all, all in one shot, uh, that is usually code for, well, none of these results are particularly exciting, so we'll release them all as a batch and put together a comprehensive explanation of what we think it all means. Now, the problem with the mithril play, it's it's in a remote region of James Bay, uh, cent- central Quebec. Uh, uh, it is a copper play. Admittedly, uh, surface values have been as high as uh, 17%. But to develop a copper mine in this part of the world, uh, it needs to be large, and it's going to have to be fairly high grade. And BHP uh, uh, invested six, uh, $5.8 million uh, a couple of weeks ago at a $1.70, a 36% premium, because it's seeing enough scale here. It's seeing the values, and it's seeing something unusual about the system that it can't quite pigeonhole. So, so it's there because it wants a ringside seat on something that could be very big. But we are in a horrible bear market, and the expectation out there is, well, you know, give us 50, 100 meters of uh, 1.5% copper, preferably in all the holes so that we can instantly do the math and come up with a deposit and say, yep, you're in the running for a uh, world-class discovery. The reality is this is unlikely to happen. Uh, it's a uh, one showing found in 2011 that became the basis for a summer visit last year that found all these surrounding boulders. Uh, they then did an IP survey over top of it, which showed a linear east-west uh, trend uh, for, for a couple kilometers, uh, suggesting uh, uh, disseminated sulfides of some sort. Uh, that got them pretty excited because they didn't observe any uh, any pyrite in the boulders that they looked at. So. That could mean that this this anomaly is being caused by calcopyrite, the the copper sulfide. And it says, man, there's a meaningful gold credit there. So they went in there and drilled uh, these 10 holes. Uh, uh, They're all angled holes, uh, probably a maximum vertical depth of 150 to 200 meters. Uh, They probably have an XRF unit which uh, can read copper values. It can't. It's not the same as an assay. It can just give you a general range because where you point it uh, uh, at the core will will affect the, the reading. But uh, when the core comes up, they can you know get a rough sense. Are we getting copper values? So the, the market fears. Well, maybe this is going to be a um, you know a big bust. Uh, we've got the surface veneer of values. You drill underneath it, uh, and you come up nothing and. Uh, and the whole thing tanks. And that's the attitude out there. And yet at the same time, the CEO, Gino Roger, he, he's in Boston and New York, uh, pounding the pavement, uh, selling the mithril story to family offices, uh, you know, uh, uh, generalist types of funds, high net worth investors. And you kind of ask yourself, why would he be wasting his time over there uh, before putting out any results, and especially if uh, the, the guys in the field have said, well, you know, this is going to be a very lame 0.2, 0.3% averaging uh, uh, copper system, which everybody's going to laugh at, and the uh, stock's going to tank, and, uh, and you, know, you know, why bother? And the reason is that I think he's sitting on something 
probably not a uh, spectacular uh, discovery hole yet, uh, but enough evidence uh, of a major copper system uh, that has a lot of scale, and they are just beginning to unravel it. So the news that we get in the middle of the month, yes, there'll be a whole bunch of assays in there, and we'll do all the sections and sort of see what kind of tonnage it represents, but we're also going to be looking for an explanation of what is the geology? What's controlling the mineralization? Where is all all this going? So the weakness in the market, uh, it's not so much a, a function of like, oh, it's guaranteed to be lousy. It's it's more a function of the this this growing sense that the uh, the Canadian junior resource sector is dying. And on Monday, uh, you know, Macquarie, the big Australian entity, uh, pulled the plug on the research and sales division of Macquarie Canada. And that used to be something called Orion that they bought a decade before, ago. And then before that, uh, it was Yorkton, which uh, changed its name uh, in, in 2003. And Yorkton used to be a big force in the resource junior sector. But uh, so, so, you know, in the last while, they, Macquarie Canada probably has not been that important, but it's the symbolic pulling of the plug on Canada. That's a big deal. And uh, Bay Street... Uh, it seems to have completely lost interest in the uh, in the resource juniors. Uh, we're seeing all kinds of stocks uh, tipping into the garbage can. Gold pulling back. It was uh, uh, I think below 1270 today. Uh, th- that isn't that isn't particularly helpful. And the TSX Venture resource listings. Um, they're now trading eight to fifteen between eight and fifteen million dollars of value per day. Uh, compared to say a hundred million dollars for cannabis and all the other non-resource listings, uh, the eight to fifteen million is not as bad as 2015 when it dipped below five five million dollars. But it is on a downtrend from from higher levels in the past couple of years. So there is this sense that uh, we're at the end of an era, and with this uh, comes deep pessimism that everything is going to fail on on us. Every expiration play is doomed to deliver nothing. The, the news release uh, had a lot of content about the gradient IP survey that they completed on a 10 by 3 kilometer grid over uh, what appears to be sort of the um, uh, east-west uh, trend of this mithril showing. The drilling was based on a smaller dipole dipole IP survey and uh, that cannot penetrate as deep as uh, the gradient one which can look as deep as 200 meters and uh, these IP surveys uh, what they what they measure is uh, two things resistivity which is uh, how easily a current uh, will flow through the rock uh, from one end to uh, to another end and the other is the chargeability which is uh, like a capacitor is as this current goes through how much of it gets stored and how long does it take for it to die away? And an IP survey is not particularly good for what you call mass sulfide deposits. Uh, for example, if you did one over the uh, the ovoid uh, of, of of diamond fields uh, from 19, 1995, uh, that would not have much of a signal because that is so conductive it wouldn't even hold the charge. But in a disseminated system, all the little metallic grains they tend to be separated from each other so that when the current goes through, they end up holding a charge, which is why these IP surveys are uh, are important for detecting the, the sort of disseminated systems that have a copper resource, because a copper resource, except in a volcanogenic mass sulfide system, uh, uh, tends not to be in, in a sort of a mass of sulfide type of a, a host uh, which, which would be very, very conductive. So what they, when they extended this grid, um, uh, they identified five more of these IP anomalies. They're not as strong, which could mean simply that the, they're, they're, they're not as deep, but they're on trend, and it seems to make sense. The trend uh, curves towards the northeast, uh, sort of wrapping around uh, a, a granite uh, of some sort, uh, and then stopping uh, uh, where the uh, uh, Monzo diorite exists uh, to the east, and so these are these. This stretches over like a 10 kilometer length, and uh, these are all targets that require follow up, and, and much of it is covered by overburden. 
So, uh, you know, they'll have to look very closely to see if there's anything outcropping, uh, uh, that be- can become a new, a new focus. But, uh, the reason they're quite excited about this is, uh, you know, they've already know what there is underneath the, uh, um, you know, the, the two kilometer stretch that they did drill those uh, 10 holes on. Yes, they haven't given us assays, but I suspect, uh, uh, they have a pretty good sense that it's good enough that we need to keep exploring on this system. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Azimut put out, uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, results of a lake bottom sediment survey done on one, one square, square kilometer, uh, uh, uh centers, and it showed that, uh, in the western portion of the Piqua property that, ex- or the western part of Mithil that extends onto the Piqua, that there's a big seven, eight kilometer late copper anomaly there. We're seeing the IP stretching the other direction. So, so we're looking at a, at a trend, a 20 kilometer trend that in one part has clearly has copper and the other part they've got the, the sort of IP signature that suggests that disseminated something, something is present. Uh, so, the, I think we do have a major, major play emerging. Um, the company also, uh, uh, what you could, they published an important graphic uh, of the IP survey, and uh, the uh, main one, the, the main mithril one, which is about four kilometers uh, and the two kilometer portion of which they they they, they drilled uh, in the original dipole dipole diagram that they gave. It sort of peters out close to the. Uh, Piqua border, but this deeper penetrating uh, gradient uh, IP survey shows it charging right up to the boundary, and so therefore this thing probably continues onto the azimuth ground. And of course, azimuth stock has been fading away also in, in the past couple of weeks. But uh, one of the really interesting things is that there is a big four kilometer, uh, very high chargeability IP anomaly just to the south of the mithril one, um, running parallel to it. And it's unusual in that all the other ones have resistivity lows. And uh, while this one has a resistivity high. And and that's kind of puzzling. The resistivity is created when the rock, the the host rock, uh, is, is, is very dense and the current does not flow through it very easily. It still flows through it and allows uh, any sulfides in it to be uh, to, to, to hold the charge and create the IP anomaly and it is used in particular for for low sulfidation epithermal systems such as West Haven's um, uh, south zone in the uh, in the shovel nose area where you want the the resistivity high to show you where the quartz vein is within which the uh, the high grade gold and silver will have piled up so this thing will this thing also charges onto the Piqua ground, and it's a mystery as to what this is all about because there's certainly no holes in there. And then they put this one little teaser in that news release talking about a local anomaly that uh, um, correlates with an EM conductor. And there's nothing circled on the map, and I was scratching my head wondering, where is this? I mean, obviously they're referring to an IP anomaly. And then I realized, well, the grid is at an angle, and they didn't publish the bottom part. And then I realized, oh, I wonder if this other map they published of the magnetics on which they'd circled the four conductors pretty close to the uh, southern boundary, if it's the western one, which would be inside this grid. So they indicate they're going to send crew out there to follow up uh, what this is all about. And, and so here you have a conductor um, correlating with, with an IP anomaly, um, Nobody's had ever had boots on the ground, so they have no idea what outcrops there, or what's there to be found, and and this will be good news for uh, 92 Resources Corp, which uh, had a pretty bad day today, as everybody said, oh, this play's a bust, nothing's happening, no great Canadian area play, because the FCI West project, that property that they just uh, picked up last week, uh, well, that is very close to where this uh, uh, combined IP anomaly and conductor. Uh, has been highlighted by a Midland Exploration as something worth following up. So nowhere near being a bust, uh, probably uh, not going to be confirmed as an instant world-class discovery that sets everything going to the moon, but certainly something that I think uh, in the second half of uh, the month will turn around, uh, we'll get an explanation of what's going on. Midland has already signaled that they were going going back on the property and the uh, 
the first week of June. They said they're going to do a minimum of 5,000 meters, a minimum, uh, um, you know, uh, what they said is going to do more than 5,000 meters. Uh, and, and that makes it open-ended. They don't want to say anything yet until they've re- released results because that would be kind of like signaling in advance that they have something fantastic. But I'm pretty optimistic that uh, this play is alive and well and will really come to life uh, once we have this first round of drilling out of the way and a better sense of what the geology is that makes this uh, play tick. We'll have more with John Kaiser right after this. Grand Portage Resources recently completed the 2018 drill program on its 100% controlled Herbert Gold Discovery property located in the prolific Juneau Belt in southeast Alaska. Drill results are expected through late 2018. Past drill results included numerous multi-ounce gold assays on multiple veins. Grand Portage trading symbols are GPG on the TSX Venture, GPTRF on the OTCQB, and GPB on Frankfurt. For more information, please visit our website, Grand Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp, MGI and the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected several high-grade gold intersections, including 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. Additional drill targets on the LH property have been identified by a 2018 drone airborne magnetic survey to further evaluate a pyrotite and rich gold-bearing system. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Kaiser. John, is there any way to get exposure to a possible James Bay area play without suffering the downside if Midland serves up a cow pie later this month? Well, you know, I am very doubtful that they're going to serve up a, uh, you know, a cow pie, you know, like really disappointing results. So the, the body language of the company, uh, uh, everything that they're signaling, and the fact, as I mentioned uh, earlier, that uh, they do have an XRF unit to tell them, like, sort of what sort of level of copper values they're getting in, in the core. Um, what we will probably have is something that's kind of in between world-class confirmation and you know, a flop. So very encouraging results, uh, and that will gradually rebuild the market interest that seems to be waning. However in case it tends to be more towards the not-so-good side, uh, Midland would be hurt, uh, Azimuth would be hurt, and so would uh, 92 Resources Corp. Now, now 92 Resources Corp and Azimuth, they're already starting to fade, so, so the pain is already being dealt out by a very, very fickle market. But if you want to have exposure to the upside of this play, without having the downside uh, to sort of mediocre results or even worse, heaven forbid, that they actually are truly, truly terrible results, then the stock that I've just introduced to everybody is Quebec Precious Metals Corp. And their story is the Sakami, Sakami Project, which is a gold play about 90 kilometers northwest of the Eleanor Gold Mine. And this is uh, 150 kilometers or more west of the mithril area, so so it has nothing whatsoever to do with the mithril copper play and, and these other, um, you know, satellites, but it's in the James Bay area, and this is a gold play for which no resource estimate has yet been calculated, but there's been 25,000 meters drilled, 132 holes into this system. It's a slab-like body, sort of roughly 800 uh, meters a long strike, uh, and 550 meters down plunge. Uh, it's still partly open along strike at the sh- at the deeper part, and it's certainly open down plunge. And they are going in there this year to uh, do some more drilling with the goal of delivering a resource estimate in uh, in the first quarter by the first quarter of 2020. And uh, their their goal is to achieve uh, two to three million ounce resource with a, you know, three to four gram per ton grade, uh, underground mineable. And that's sort of the, uh, the bar that Gold Corp has said and has set. And it's been a big investor in this company. It was formed through the amalgamation of a company called Canada Strategic Metals and Matamac Exploration, which used to be the Kippewa, you know, heavy rare earth, uh, 
uh, Junior back in that sort of 2010, 2011 rare earth bubbles. They also own the Sakami project and the uh, critical met, critical uh, Canada strategic metals. Uh, uh, it was earning 70% of this project. Uh, it had originally been generated in the early, early 2000s. And they decided last year, let's just merge these two companies together. And the CEO, um, uh, uh, John Sebastian Lavalley, um, he decided to step down, become the exploration VP. The other hat he wears is a CEO of, of Critical Metals, which is advancing the uh, Rose Lithium Project, also in the James Bay region. And then two uh, veterans of the highly respected veterans of the resource sector, Norman Champagny and uh, and John Hick, joined as CEO and chairman. And the companies all suffered a, a rollback as part of the merger, and it got refinanced. Uh, probably has two and a half to three million dollars left. That's probably not enough for a fifteen thousand meter program that's planned. But the the goal here is, uh, you know, based on what I can see on the on the on doing some basic arithmetic, they might have something between 1.3 and 1.9 million ounces in there, depending on what the mineable width ends up being and what the cutoff grade is. So they're probably not there yet. So part of this summer's uh, drilling will involve uh, expansion drilling, build build more ounces, and then get the get that resource estimate done so that they know what the you know where they stand, and and of course this is an optionality play too because if gold price ever went into an up, uptrend, uh, you would see a benefit. You could lower the cutoff grade, get those ounces up, uh, and certainly you would attract uh, uh, investors. So at the moment, it's kind of uh, sort of half optionality, half still discovery exploration. The property has 23 kilometers of strike. Uh, um, there is uh, uh, about eight kilometers to the north. They came up with some new showings, uh, a long trend that they will uh, have to uh, follow up. So there is potential for them to come up with additional zones that can build up the, the ounces for this. So this company is being priced in the 20 to 30 cent range based exclusively on the Sakami project. They have some other uh, gold projects in the James Bay regions. Uh, they're probably one of the more active ones ones in there that aren't stuck with uh, sort of projects uh, uh, such as East Main with Eau Claire into which $50 million have been sunk and, uh, and it still doesn't look like it's viable or serious with its Chichu project for which we're still awaiting awaiting our resource estimate. But the way this gives you exposure to Midland's mithril copper play is three claim groups that they staked in 2017 based largely on Sort of government mapping in that region, and uh, the two claims are the uh, the Blanche claims, which are these elongated claims uh, covering this uh, sort of um, east-west trend of metavolcanics, uh, just north of the Trans Taiga Highway, and uh, north of the, uh, the the eastern part of the Piqua project, uh, and and close to the um, where the Mithril trend uh, begins, and then they also have. The Charles property, which is a northeast-oriented group of claims uh, uh, that uh, was staked to cover, uh, you know, the same sort of uh, meta meta volcanic rocks, but also a, what appears to be a big mag anomaly. And and, and Norman Champagne admits that uh, you know we have really no idea what what is there, and we just staked it because it was potentially interesting. But since then. Midland has staked everything right up to the western boundary of the Charles claim and continued on the eastern boundary. And whatever it is that is going on in, in Midland, the Midland team's head about the geology of what makes this mithril system a tick, this Charles property is smack in the middle. And the market is largely oblivious to it. It, it actually joins up with the Corvette project of 92 resources uh, to the south, which is also this inconvenient uh, interruption in what uh, would have been this uh, 20, 30 co uh, kilometer east-west trend that Midland would have staked if it was completely open. So if Mithril turns into a big flop and uh, uh, Azimut and uh, 92 resources sag, well, that's not going to do anything to, uh, to, to, to Quebec precious metals because uh, it's not carrying any speculative premium for the possibility that they have claims uh, next to and almost within 
an emerging um, discovery area play. Uh, Quebec Precious Metals Corp. will be at the Metals Investor Forum where I am speaking in, uh, in on, on May 24th and 25th in, uh, in, in, in May. And uh, we're still waiting to see if 92 Resources Corp. will accept an invitation to be there. So that conference, uh, which will take place about a week or two after Midland puts out its results. It's going to be very interesting. Midland and Azimuth, who were invited, cannot be there because the key people have um, other obligations uh, uh, already uh, um, in place, so they cannot be there. So these two companies uh, will be there, and uh, I suspect we will get some sort of buzz about the James Play area probably getting started at that conference. We'll have more with John Kaiser right after this. I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of PowerVan Solutions. PowerVan is a cloud-based provider of auction, inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. PowerVan Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol, PBX, and on the OTCQB symbol, PWWBF, and on Frankfurt symbol, 1ZV. For more information, please visit us at PowerBandSolutions.com. I'm Douglas Mason, CEO of Naturally Splendid, symbol NSP on the TSX Venture Exchange. Naturally Splendid is a biotechnology and consumer products company focused on the global cannabis and health markets. Naturally Splendid is expanding distribution in this rapidly growing market with products currently in Canada, the USA, South Korea, Germany, and Australia. To view our comprehensive company presentation and for more information, please visit our website at naturallysplendid.com. Welcome back. We're chatting with John Kaiser. John, can you give Discovery Watch a new exploration story that does not require barn burner drill holes to create value? Well, several weeks ago for um, Kaiser Research Online members, I, I wrote up a junior called Sonoro Metals Corp. Um, it is now headed by John Darch, who is a former major force on the uh, Canadian junior scene. Um, he was active in the late 80s until about 2005. Uh, he was sort of the driving force uh, behind the crew group of companies. Uh, um, he left that group in 2002 when the Norwegian group that got involved uh, decided to take it in a different direction. He stayed around for several more years uh, in the uh, uh, with, uh, with with Western Geopower, which had uh, the Mega Creek uh, uh, geothermal project. Uh, uh, north of north of Whistler and north of Vancouver in British Columbia, but even by then, 2005, he left that because uh, Rick Rule was steering that company into a California geothermal plant. So, so he effectively retired from the the resource junior sector. Did a number of different unrelated things, and the most recent one that he was uh, uh, deeply involved with was uh, uh, assisting the Aka Hill Tribe in Thailand to shift from cultivating opium to developing fair trade, high quality coffee um, called Doi Chang. And so this has been sort of this big turnaround project that he has been involved with. Uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, Canterbury Coffee took over the marketing uh, responsibility for, for this, this, this coffee, with which I have tasted. It's, it's excellent coffee. And I think he was getting pretty bored with... Uh, with with things and decided, you know, let's go back to the resource sector. And of course, he couldn't pick a worse time to return. He was very well networked in uh, in, 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 in during, during the um, 90s in, in in Switzerland. But that world has uh, has sort of dissolved. The Swiss aren't the the important force they were for investing in in resource juniors uh, that they once were. But he has developed considerable uh, uh, relationships in Asia and. Uh, as he was contemplating uh, what to what to do, how to get back into this sector, he ended up bumping into Ken McLeod, who is the CEO of Sonoro Metals. And Sonoro Metals itself was really the baby of Gary Freeman, um, who had taken taken it over in 2008. At the time, his primary flagship was a uh, Pediment Gold, uh, whose San Antonio project was acquired by um, Argonaut Gold for about 145 million dollars worth of worth of stock and and since then Gary Freeman had just sort of kicked around he had a couple of shells some of them 
cash rich Sonoro was one of them. But then he got unlucky and caught a very bad form of cancer and passed away in early uh, 2018. And so Sonoro was a bit of an orphan company. But uh, Mel Herdrick, who was at the, the, the driving force behind the San Antonio project, and he's a geologist uh, with, with uh, a considerable network in, in Mexico, he ended up convincing Ken McLeod to uh, option the Cerro Calici project in Sonoro. And that's uh, next to the Mercedes mine of Mer- Mer- Premier Gold and, and, and another project, the Cerro Prieto of, of Gold Group. Uh, and this project had had work in the past by a Canadian junior. It, it has about, about a dozen vein swarms in it that, you know, the, the old-timers had worked for the high-grade components uh, that the previous junior had tried to make something of it but, but couldn't really make it hang together. And, and Mel's idea was, you know, we need to treat this as a set of bulk tonnage future pits. It's all oxidized, so they can be open pit mined and heat bleached. And so John Darch decided that this was going to be the starter project for a company rebuilding exercise. And he joined uh, uh, late last year, became part of the company, and uh, they have just completed a 60-hole drill program. Now, your question was, uh, you know, uh, give, give me something that doesn't require a, a barn burner discovery hole. And this is an example where you are not going to get some huge uh, 100 meters of 10 gram gold and 100, 100 gram silver or something and have a fantastic new discovery. This is going to be a low grade system. The individual veins, uh, you know, they may spike up here and there but they're not going to be underground mineable veins. It's going to be one of a, can they all statistically add up to create a bulk tonnage uh, deposit? And it's going to be probably between 0.4 and 0.6 grams per ton, which puts it on the possibly the, 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 the marginal uh, level in terms of being worth developing. But uh, John Darch, he's, he's pretty optimistic that we are headed into a, real price gold uptrend. And so the strategy now is to, uh, with those 60 holes that they've done, uh, get a resource estimate done, demonstrate what we have. Ideally, they'd like to get up to a million ounces down the road, but they're only going to get part of the way there. Uh, they would like to uh, uh, get a type of gold loan to fund a pilot plant heap leach study to show demonstrate what the uh, metallurgical characteristics of this are and set this up for, uh, okay, can we raise the money to put this into production or at least have somebody else acquire the project? And Mel Herdrick, uh, you know, he's, he's extremely knowledgeable about everything that's going on in Mexico and uh, and John Darch is a, is a deal maker type. So this is what I would call a stepping stone type project. Uh, it does require optimism that gold will develop an uptrend. It doesn't require you to have an apocalyptic vision of, you know, $10,000 gold or anything. And it doesn't require you to expect any sort of barn burner drill hole to take this up. It just requires you to expect that John Darch will develop the profile of this company, pull in capital at higher at higher levels, uh, uh, utilize the uh, talent of uh, Mel Herdrick and his team to to uh, pr- outline this resource and demonstrate that it exists. Demonstrate that it can be can be heap leached uh, uh, in, in a predictable manner, and then pull in other projects uh, uh, as as they build up the strength of this company. So it's a it's a bottom fish in the classic sense of where you do not need a discovery hole to make it happen. You just need technical talent, pulling together what has already been sort of figured out by others in the past and and tying it all up. John, thanks a lot for the update. You're welcome, Jim. We've been speaking with John Kaiser, his website, kaiserresearch.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on Discovery Watch are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Discovery Watch is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.